Hi, everybody, and welcome back to our YouTube channel. If you're looking for hope and encouragement, then this is a great online place for you. I'm Reverend Kyle Dorr from St. John's Church here in Grimsby, and welcome to Phone a Friend Friday, where I uh, reach out and give a call to a, a friend, an acquaintance, a mentor in ministry, and we just have a chat for a few minutes. Today, we are joined by uh, Reverend Dr. Stuart McDonald, who is the Vice Principal, Academic Dean, uh, Professor at Knox College. He's a, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a minister, a musician. Did I miss any other hats that you wear? No, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a hat rack you've got. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for for coming uh, and, uh, and being a part of our conversation today. Thank you, Kyle. It's nice that, to be here. That's great. Um, so, why don't you, uh, for those that don't know you, tell us a little bit about um, sort of your involvement with Knox College? You've been there. Have you, has it, have you reached your twenty fifth anniversary yet? Um, I won't waste everybody's time. I started in 96, so yep. yes, I probably have. Uh, okay. And it's just whether it's 25, when we all took it, but I've been there much longer. I came on a three-year contract. Okay. So I graduated from Knox College in 1985. Yeah. Went and did a rural and small town ministry just a little bit east of Toronto, yep. uh, around the Coburg area, and I nice. still consider Coburg home. Mm -hmm. uh, but I uh, came to Knox College, and I've been there in a variety of capacities since then. One of the consistent things is I've often been the person teaching the church history courses. Mm -hmm. but I've also taught ministry courses and other things. So that's, uh, and I continue to enjoy doing that. That's great. So basically, you're in your 25th of three years. Yeah, yeah, it was one of those th contracts that I it was renewed, by the way, <laughs> they didn't forget. Uh, but I, but what's also funny is I sometimes sit back and count what job I'm on. Yeah, because it's been reconfigured so many times. So I'm on either job four or job five. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Either, either way, that's a, that's a lot of uh, faithful yeah. service, and that's something oh, we can uh, yeah. celebrate and, uh, and be thankful for. Well, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, we can have our, our chat today, uh, and I've got a, a few questions for you. Some are a little more of a deep dive, and some are, uh, you know, maybe not so deep, maybe uh, fun anyway. So uh, kind of the first question that I want you to think about and, and talk about a little bit. Um, so this, uh, this pandemic has been difficult on everybody in so many different ways. Yeah. Um, but considering that, what's one blessing that you have experienced as a result of pandemic living? Um, yeah, the difficulties are easier sometimes to look at. <laughs> I know. Um, but there are blessings. And one of the most interesting blessings has been seeing how communities have formed themselves in new ways around um, this technology and it's how we can use it. And so an example from the college, uh, uh, we've been able to hold worship services. We've been able to do fun things. Uh, Caitlin, uh, our assistant registrar has just been amazing at bringing people together to do fun things over the internet. So that's been really, fascinating. In my personal life, uh, the musical community I've part of has managed to pull off an online open mic. Oh, great. So rather than all meeting at the little pub and playing, we've all been recording and then showing up on Tuesday nights from our individual homes and uh, commenting and chatting and encouraging. And mm. it's really interesting the different way that that has built community. And as much as we miss each other, we'd all like to be together. That's been a real blessing. And I think when we come back, we're going to be much closer. Uh, and so that's been kind of an unexpected uh, reality. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder too, and uh, my bit of experience with, you know, either video chats or, or watching services online, I wonder sometimes too, it, it sort of supports the introverts or those that are a bit more reflective thinkers and that they can share maybe and respond. They can take a little bit of time to put some thoughts together or a comment or encouraging words together and, you know, they can go a little bit deeper in that way too than just, you know, sitting, sitting across the table at the pub or, you know, in the coffee hour kind of thing. Absolutely. Too, you know? 
And every everybody's in the, in, a, in a weird way in the same room rather than just at our different tables. That's been yeah. one of the things that other folks I didn't really know. And the same with teaching in particular, it does give the quieter students an opportunity uh, to speak. You have to make sure that you monitor the chat and all those yeah. things we're learning to do. Uh, but no, it does do that. And I think that's been a real blessing. So it, it's been hard, but there's also been some really good things. I think in terms of worship, I've also been struck that we really get down to what the core is. What mm -hmm. is it we really should do? And the best services, the ones I've enjoyed most, have let other things just go away. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Um, well, you've uh, spent uh, some time in congregational ministry and, and time in uh, academic uh, sort of ministry, I guess, for lack of a, a better term. Um, is there something that maybe you, you miss about congregational ministry? You've missed um, maybe that isn't so prevalent in the academic community, community or just happens in a different way? Yeah, there are two things I miss. Um, the, the one would be relevant now, the other not so much. Uh, I miss writing sermons. Mm. I really found that such an honor, such a privilege to be able to have the time to do a really serious look at scripture, to take mm. time to think about it, to wander around, you know, go on a walk and think about it. Uh, I, I write it, test it. I really enjoy the preaching. Mm -hmm. I preach about only four times or so a year now. Uh, and I'm okay with that because I have other things I need to do yeah. that are really important. Uh, but I do miss that. Uh, mm. The other thing that I found really meaningful in congregational ministry was funerals. Mm. Uh, just because that's when your presence alongside people is often uh, very comforting to them mm -hmm. uh, and very helpful. And I always felt needed. And I really am thinking about those doing funerals in these very different times where you mm -hmm. don't have that interaction. No. And that I don't have any experience of is, is trying to get that over um, a Zoom call. Yeah. I used to go and hang around the funeral homes. That sounds awful. But at the visitation, I would just go and be there, mm -hmm. talk to the family, but just stay, ar stay around and listen. Yep. And you've yeah. got such a fascinating sense of people from that. Yeah. So yeah. I do miss funerals in a weird way. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, for sure. Uh, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's so different either on, you know, on Zoom or electronically or even uh, you know, providing comfort from six feet away. It's, there's just yeah. that sort of yeah. interesting barrier too that we have to, yeah. uh, to uh, go around. Um, well, you've uh, in your kind of academic uh, life um, done a lot of uh, fascinating work on, um, sort of ancient, not ancient, but uh, church history, and but also some of the uh, the newer things uh, and trends in and sort of religion in Canada and uh, Christianity in Canada. Uh, and you've done a lot of work on on witches and witch trials, which is uh, just I, I think really interesting and fascinating. Um, do you think, like, and you know, I'm asking a guy that's researched this. Uh, certainly, there there were a lot of um, mistrials and people being mislabeled as witches and all kinds of awful things. But do you think there was anyone, you know, actually legitimately practicing witchcraft that was put on trial? That's a difficult question, and one has to be careful because you're about to ignite major uh, <laughs> academic debates. Um, <laughs> One of the things that's fascinating that I've been thinking about, and in our own lives in particular, it's interesting when a behavior is considered normal, and then all of a sudden it's criminalized. Mm. Um, one of the things when I was a student at Knox College in the 80s that I could do indoors at Knox College was smoke my pipe. I don't smoke anymore, but I smoked <laughs> a pipe occasionally then. Yeah. Um, and we could even do that in the reading room. You're now <laughs> not allowed to even smoke no. uh, anywhere on the University of Toronto campus, no. even outdoors. So that's why it's such a hard question. Were there people who were doing charms? Were there people who thought they were helping people, but they were doing activities uh, that others now considered to be illegal? I think the answer that, to that is yes. Mm -hmm when people really 
think, were they witches? Were these people actively involved in anything demonic? I think the answer to that is hardly anyone, if anyone. Mm -hmm. But were there people doing things that had just been criminalized? I don't think there's any question about that. Just like there's occasionally someone you'll see smoking at the University of Toronto campus, even yeah. though you can't anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, that's that's a very interesting take. Um, I know this is uh, may, maybe a, a trickier question to answer too, but as a, as a historian, how do you think, I don't know, like 20, 30, 40 years from now, um, historians will kind of be reflecting on the pandemic or seeing, um, you know, how, how will they be interpreting things, do you think? Or what will the major issues that will oh, jump out to them be? That's, that's really fascinating. And I, I think we don't know yet. I mm -hmm. think what is so different about the last major global pandemic is that this one will not get buried inside the history of a war. Mm. Most of us didn't even know there was the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918-1919. Some of us had some sense of it, but it wasn't something that was talked about because I think with the experience of war, people were just so exhausted, they forgot it and mm -hmm. moved on. I don't think we will. Uh, so, But it depends. If the economy rebounds, then we'll have one story. Yes. Uh, if the uh, political polarization that this has amplified, didn't create it, but it's no. amplified it. Mm -hmm. If that disappears, we'll have one story to tell. Mm -hmm. But if all of a sudden we have the collapse of a major democracy uh, and an authoritarian government coming to power in Britain or someplace like that, or Italy or wherever, that will change the narrative entirely. Mm -hmm. So uh, a little too early to tell, but I don't think this one will be forgotten. Indeed, mm -hmm. I think moving forward, this might be one of those moments that people really look to. What I'm hoping it does is it alert people to how interconnected we are. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to deal with the big problems in our world, we can't deal with them as individuals. We have to deal with them together. And I think that's one of the things we need to take from this. Yes, ab absolutely. Well, a couple, um, a couple lighter questions for you. Um, you are uh, quite a, a passionate musician, skilled, skilled musician, uh, guitarist and vocalist. And um, do you remember the first song you learned to play on guitar? And do you still know how to play that song? Yes and yes. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, uh, wonderful. Um, and uh, I got my other question too, uh, and, and, you know, I'll put you on the hot seat a little bit if I can. Um, so you're, you're currently the, the vice principal at Knox. You've, you've served a, a bit of time as acting principal as well, if, if memory yeah. serves correct. So I want you to think back through your own uh, academic career right through, you know, elementary, high school, you know, undergrad, your, your doctoral work. Were you ever called into the principal's office as a student? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was too afraid to growing up because uh, I lived in a small town of 3,000 people and my father was the police chief. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I would hear about it both ways. <laughs> well, and mine was the same. But my best experience was in the vice principal's office where I'd, go, I'd gone down uh, to quit high school. And really? He, and he said to me, no, you can't quit today, Stuart. Just take the rest of the day off and go home. <laughs> so um, he was a wonderful man. He was a wonderful man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wise counsel, too. Just don't, yeah. don't yep. decide today, yep. sleep on it, and come back tomorrow. And <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. And the rest, the rest is uh, is history, and well, it's in history books, but not about uh, your high school career, anyway. So that's good. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I, I appreciate your uh, enduring my uh, my grilling um, and sharing your thoughts. Um, and you had sort of prepared sort of words of encouragement or, or things for us to think about today. Yeah, I had Kyle, and one of the things that I found myself doing for the last couple of years. Um, is looking back at the Psalms. And there's a lot of reasons for that. 
I think some of my interest began a few years ago when I was really thinking about the words we were singing in church mm -hmm. and looking at where there's some richer images we could go to. And I stumbled across some wonderful contemporary metrical psalms. And that really got me thinking about how the psalms could appear again in music. Mm. As you know, the psalms have always been central to the life of the church. In a monastery, the uh, monks would go through the entire book of the psalms every week, and then they'd start again. So it was a constant cycle of prayer through the book of the psalms. And then in our own tradition, Reformed Christians, Presbyterians, um, we developed that idea of a metrical psalm where we took the verses of Hebrew scripture and we kind of versified them into whatever language we were speaking, French or English. And then we had those verses and we would sing them along to popular tunes. Mm -hmm. and I mean, I know those are really, really rich um, texts for me. And so it was thinking about that, that I began to go back into the Psalms and read them more and more. And I just want to read a little bit, the beginning of Psalm 62, the first mm -hmm. seven verses. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their, their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. O God, on God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. I just think those are so wonderful uh, words, those images mm -hmm. of, of assurance, of waiting, of trusting in God. And that's really become one of the Psalms that's been my go-to for the last couple of years even more so in these last 11 months, I must say. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's one that I've really gone back to time and time again. And it, it's become particularly important to me because there is a metrical psalm, a modern metrical psalm that has just been written about this by an American um, uh, composer by the name of Wendell Kimbrew. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the chorus, do you know this one at all, Kyle? I've heard you sing it online, but I, I, would, yeah. I would hear it again. <laughs> yeah. So the chorus goes, I'll not be shaken, I'll not be shaken, for all my hope is in his love. From God alone comes my salvation. I wait and trust. His steadfast love. And yeah. what I love about that, other than the fact that it's just such a glorious mix of a lovely tune and, mm -hmm. and the words, mm -hmm. but it's the kind of thing that I just find myself when I need to singing. Uh, yes. So I just remind all of us that uh, uh, the Psalms uh, give us words of comfort. They speak to us when we're feeling down. Mm -hmm. They speak to us when we're happy. So I'm just finding myself more and more looking to the Psalms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, and just the images, as you were saying, to just really sum up the human condition, really, and kind of whatever uh, whatever season it is, um, that's that's really the, the power of, of the Psalms. And part of their kind of eternal treasure, really, is that, you know, they're written by people, you know, maybe in some situations much different than, than you and I have ever known or ever will know. But I mean, the, the emotions are there, the, the desire to be connected to God, whether that's for, um, for protection or for that sense of, this is my solid foundation, I'm not going to be shaken from this, or, you know, so being afraid or being excited or whatever. It's that, uh, summing up that relationship between God and humanity and the, the Psalms are kind of like the, like the, the love letter or the, the letters between, you know, just people and, and God in that very direct way. 
Yeah. I think so. And, and I, I, as you said, all of the different emotions, it, it was really interesting a few years ago when we were down at the um, uh, worship symposium in, at Calvin College down in Michigan. Uh, they were talking about what do you do when your hometown gets um, taken over by white supremacists? Mm. What do you sing in church? And the answer to that is from the Psalms, speaking about how long, O Lord, will you let uh, the unrighteous prosper, those yeah. kinds of images. So it does speak to all of the human condition. And I think mm -hmm. those songs of lament, the songs of joy, the songs of comfort, they all really uh, are important. Uh, absolutely. I really hope that someone uh, continues to, uh, maybe throughout this, this time, you know, just the continues their work on there's got to be an album in there somewhere of uh, reworked psalms maybe there already is but that's come out of this uh, past year's experience you know that'll <laughs> come around i'm sh and if there is i'm sure you'll let me know about it because you seem to have your ear to the ground on those kinds of things so i i i'm, I'm sure i i will uh i'll, I'll send you a couple of links because there's sure. some really exciting work there's actually a canadian yeah uh, songwriter who i will not remember his name Okay. He's affiliated with Steve Bell. Okay. And he's written some lovely stuff. And we okay. were just at his, I mean, you now go to virtual album launches, right? From your mm -hmm. home. So we were at it. His stuff is different, but really lovely. So there's a okay. couple of different traditions. So I sure. really encourage people to look at that. And we will send you those links, Kyle. Sounds good. And I'll uh, I'll put some in the video description. So those that are kind of listening, watching right now, if you uh, want to, to hear some some new music uh, that, that'll be in the video description, and I'm sure that will uh, bless bless your day as well. Um, well, I really thank you, Stuart, for for sharing uh, with uh, with us your your thoughts on Psalm 62 and just the Psalms in general, and just such a wonderful reminder of um, just how they are such a, a blessing and uh, and reminder of how we can just be open and express ourselves to to God in all. Um, situations. Um, did you want to pray or did you want me to pray? I've talked a lot. Why okay. You, pray? <laughs> you have. All right. Let's yeah. pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for uh, the gift of the Psalms that uh, we can uh, really dig into them and uh, gain uh, insights um, about uh, life uh, with you and relationship with you, life in community. Uh, and we thank you for the openness and vulnerability that we see in the Psalms and that we can be encouraged to be the same way uh, with you today. We thank you for Stuart and his uh, message uh, and his uh, visit with us. Uh, continue to bless uh, his teaching and his ministry at Knox College and the work of uh, uh, Knox College and all of our seminaries as they uh, teach uh, leaders uh, and equip people to continue sharing uh, your gospel uh, in our country and around our world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks so much uh, for for being here with us uh, today. Uh, is there sort of any uh, new books or articles that you want to kind of point people towards that you've been working on? Uh, I'm I'm good. I, uh, I'll point people to the music. I think that's more <laughs> important. Uh, I, I have less responsibility that way. <laughs> so, <laughs> sounds good. Uh, well, my guest uh, today has been Reverend Dr. Stuart McDonald from Knox College. And we thank him for uh, his time and uh, in his perspective. And I look forward to joining all of you uh, next time for Phone a Friend Friday. Again, if you're new to the channel, uh, please consider clicking the subscribe button. Uh, there's a link in the video description uh, or you can click the, uh, the button. Uh, and uh, again, that's just a way that uh, you can find some more hope and encouragement for your daily life. I will see you next time. Until then, uh, be safe, be healthy, be blessed, and go in peace.